So, ladies and gentlemen, we arrived at this point of our little workshop, the last lecture, which will be given by Andy, Andy Ho, who is a thanatologist. Who knows what is thanatology? Very good. So, I don't have to explain then. For those who don't know, Andy will explain. Andy was born in Hong Kong, grew up in Canada, made his first undergraduate degree in Canada, then he went back to Hong Kong, making his MA and PhD degree. Then he joined NTU quite recently. He is now in the School of Humanities, but I very much hope that he will join <laughs> our medical school in the future. And uh, he will talk about gracious death, or things related to dying and gracious death. But this topic is not the last one at this workshop because it is about end of life. It's just because we have built up this workshop so that we have been talking about many things, neuroscience, cognitive patterns, conflicts, conflict resolution, and so on. And now Andy will somehow summarize all these things with a major event in our life, death, and in a I hope very I'll, positive I'll way. To, I'll try to. Thank very you positive. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan Balash, for inviting me for this conference. I'm very honored to be here. And thank you for sticking with me until the very end. Uh, not the end of life, but the end of the day. Um, I want to ask you a question. There's one thing that really connects every one of us in this room. And what is that? That is true, true, right? But um, a more personal experience, what connects us? Or connects every human being in the world? Yes, death. Right? Every one of us in this room, we come from different places, different cultures, different upbringing. But at the very end of the day, every one of us will experience death in one way or another. And in a life full of impermanence, right, death is the only certainty of everything that is so uncertain. And because it's so, it's, it's so concrete, but at the same time it's so far away, uh, people from historically have talked about how to live a good death, or how to have a good death. And as early as the 1950s, um, not the 1950s, the 15th, 15th century, um, there has been a book called The Ars Moriende, The Arts of Dying, that was published by the Roman Catholic Church to actually tell the common folks how to die a good death. And what do you see in this picture? There's a man who's, who's on, his, on his deathbed. And who's behind him? Yeah, the, the Virgin Mary is behind him. And then we got Jesus right standing right next to him. We got God acting as a good shepherd with the flock of sheep and some female angels and saints. And an angel cloaking probably his parents and mother who don't want to see him die. And you got a little demon in front. This demon is actually a demon of despair. Okay? To tell you if you are surrounded by Holy Spirits, all three of them at the same time, and some sheep, then you'll probably die a good death because you will not be, not be bothered by despair anymore. I don't know about you, but if I'm actually dying, I really don't want to see so many people around me. Or saints. Or gods, right? This image was created in the 15th century. And in 1998, in 1989, a Canadian artist also experienced death. Robert Pope was a Canadian artist who lived in Montreal and Toronto. And at a very young age, he had leukemia. And throughout his whole experience with cancer, um, he, he spent his many final of his final days in the hospital. And throughout those days, he did paintings about his experience of what it's like to be dying in the hospital. And that's where mo most people die nowadays anyway. Right? How is this image different from this image? There's actually more people here. Right? There's more people. There's probably a, this person could probably be a lawyer, right? maybe parents, maybe some uh, siblings or cousins. There's maybe some other bystander or friends who's watching. 
Is this how you imagine your death to be? Or do you want your death to look like this? In an institution where all the colors of the walls are the same, the blinds that cover your bed and separate your bed from the other bed is almost the same. Right? Having all these different people telling you what you should do, what decision you should make, who you should give your money to, perhaps. Right? Do we want to live a death like this? Unfortunately, most of us would, because different from 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, we don't die from acute illness anymore. The majority of us in this room, fortunately or unfortunately, will die from a chronic illness. And cancer is the number two leading cause of death in the world, especially in the developed worlds. And this is what a dying trajectory looks like if you have cancer. From the onset of a, term, a stage three or a stage four diagnosis, you live relatively well because you do receive palliative care. That's the perks of having cancer. Right? Because most palliative care system, uh, palliative care, which is hospice care and end of life care, that provides you with comfort at the end of life rather than creation or the combination of the two, provides you with, as they claim, physical, psychosocial, spiritual care. And you live relatively stable and well until a critical moment and you drop off radically and you come to the end of your life. This is cancer. But as I said before, cancer is only the second leading cause of death in the world. Number one is actually heart disease. And this is what it looks like for someone who is suffering a chronic illness, a heart disease or lung disease. Your functional capacity starts out relatively low already. And you go through different drops in your cancer or your, your illness experiences. You might have multiple hospital admissions. You come back out and you feel relatively OK. And a few weeks later, you go back in because of an another, another, another incident. Progressively, you lose your functional capacity or even cognitive acuity towards the very end of your life. And this could last another two to five years. Can you imagine yourself, the very last two to five years of your life, living like this? I don't think we have to imagine because the majority of us will probably be in this boat together, at least in the foreseeable future. For those relatively older adults, the centurions, or people who have dementia or Alzheimer's disease, this is what the dying trajectory looks like. Even, a, even slower, a more longer duration of death, from six to eight years. And this is where complexity of end of life comes into. Back in the good old days, people functioned relatively well. And one day they got sick or got into an accident and they die relatively quickly. But in today's context, we don't die quickly. We die a long death. Right? There's this state where we call it liminality, where we're living, however, we're also dying. And it's not the fact that we're physically still alive is the fact that we're socially dead. We're progressively socially dying. All of us in this room are good at what we're doing. You know, we're academics or we're professors or we're teachers. I mean, imagine one day you lose that capacity. You lose that role of who you are in society because you got really sick. And you've gone to a hospital, came back out, you can't, there's limited mobility. And you, or you, you become so fearful or ashamed of your illness that you don't want to talk to people anymore. Become increasingly socially isolated. There's also the idea where your friends and colleagues don't know what to say to you. They never, they've never been dead. Right? How, can, how can they comfort you? And they don't know what to say. And even in today's context, you'll be surprised that there's still a portion of the population still thinks that Death by cancer, heart disease, or whatever it is, is probably bad karma. And there are people out there who don't want to be around dying people. Right? It's a bad, bad air that they, that they transpire. And I don't want to catch that bad air. And progressively, being, living in an institution, hospitals, nursing home, it's a long, 
drilling process. And death becomes, it becomes an intimidated state. You wake up looking at the same shade of walls in a hospital, or seeing the same doctor, or even different doctors, and you don't often know where you are, progressively losing your sense of personhood and individuality. Liminality, living in the betwixt and between. Not here or there, but somewhere in the middle. Not totally alive and not totally dead. And research has always shown that in the contemporary era of biomedicine, a lot of the patient who is suffering from chronic illness, no matter what it is, and they are living in an institution or even a home, suffer tremendously. For those who are living in a hospital, because every day they see the same thing over and over again, there's a great sense of disorientation. Waking up and don't know the time, waking up and don't know who they are, where their family is, or whatever they're doing. Right? There's this loss of control, this loss of sense of self. You know? Some patients could become so weak, they don't even have the strength to eat by themselves. And they have to rely on a nurse, perhaps, to come by when they are free, to feed them. Uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how long I will have. Although a cancer prognosis is usually six months at the terminal, people can live longer, much longer, or much shorter. And for people who have heart disease or lung disease, the prognosis, there is no real prognosis because it's really unpredictable. And so you don't know what's going to, what the future is hold. And people can wake up every day looking at themselves in the mirror, am I going to die today? Or how much time do I have left? And that's great concern. Living in this uncertainty, loss of control, it's great existential pain. And we don't know what to do. And with all these uncertainty and all these existential pain and suffering, people live in depression, anxiety, lost hope, lost meaning, don't know why I am here anymore. Why am I even here? Why am I living? I don't want to become a burden to my family or society. There's even this desire for death, desire for euthanasia or assisted suicide, because the suffering and the pain is too overwhelming. Knowing this, over the past 20 years or so, there's been tons of research looking at what can we do or what does it mean to die a good death. These are some of the, the consolidation of the research that's been going on across the world, around the world in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, United States, and UK, looking at what good death means. And look at this list. When you look at this list, most of these lists are saying, well, to know when death is coming, that's pretty hard, right? And, and understand what can be expected, that's easier. You now, if they're informed, that's easier. To be able to retain control of what happens, to have proper pain control and symptom relief, that's also important. Now, that's the most basic thing that we must provide for people who are facing the end of life. Another thing is like to have information, to have access to hospice care, to have control who is by my bedside, who is going to take care of me, to be able to have advanced directives. For those of you, do you know who, what advanced directives is? Yeah? For those of you who don't know, it's basically when you're still conscious and you can make acute decision, a cognitively acute, and you can still make decision about your care, you can put into writing about what type of care you want in the case that you fell unconscious, you got into an accident, and you won't be able to wake up. So people do want to have that choice and that autonomy in making decisions about their care at the end of life. To have time to say goodbye, uh, to able to leave when it's time to go and not to prolong life. Right? Not to hasten death nor to prolong life. And actually, finally, this list goes on and on about control and autonomy and it finally goes into, well, perhaps they also need spiritual support, emotional support as well. And one thing that's really highlighted for the past, past century, not century, decade, but the past 10, 10 years or so, there's this renewed emphasis on what dignity means. If you read some of the hospice care, palliative care, or nurse's manual, or code of conduct, they would often say that it is our goal is to preserve, maintain, and promote people's sense of dignity at the end of life. That's, that's wonderful. Wonderful, because if you don't know, if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 1, within the first 10 words, 
all human beings are born free and equal in dignity. The very first article within the first 10 words, we talked about the importance of dignity. And dignity is nowhere more important when someone is dying, right? when someone is so vulnerable. And in the palliative care profession, hospice profession, and of life care profession, over the past 10 years, they've always talked about the importance of promoting people's dignity, preserving it, maintaining it. However, what does it mean? What does dignity mean? It's a big word, right? We use it in the, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 1, but no one actually go on and elaborate or deliberate what dignity means to people. And without that clarification, especially at the end of life, and despite how, how much aspiration we, we have in terms of improving the quality of life of those who are dying, we really don't know how to do it. Because dignity is an elusive concept. Well, fortunately, um, in 2002, uh, Professor Harvey Shosnoff in the, from the University of Manitoba in Canada, who is also the chair of palliative care in, in, the, in the Society of Canada, has done a qualitative study, interviewing 50 dying patients right beside their deathbed, asking them a series of simple questions. So what does it mean to you to have dignity now? In your experience of illness, what have happened that you think or you felt a sense of dignity? Simple questions. And he was able to identify three major categories of dignity that are practical, that are easily understood, and they can actually be exercised or executed. The first area of dignity he talked about is something called illness-related concern. This is when a person uh, really deals with the physical aspect of care, right? proper pain management. Uh, there's good symptom control. When a person can still have cognitive acuity and functional capacity to do the things that he wanted or she wanted. The most basic, fundamental idea of palliative care. And secondly, he talked about this idea of dignity conserving repertoire, which is how a person perceives his own world or the world around him, or his worldview. Can he maintain a sense of hope, pride, perhaps fighting resilience? Can he accept that death is a natural part of life? And can he maintain those perspectives through these practices, living in the moment, maintaining normalcy? seeking spiritual support. The third dimension he talked about is something called social dignity inventory. And this has to do with the interpersonal aspect of care. Whether I'm becoming, whether or do I feel a sense of burden to my family or my community, whether my patients or my, my doctors and nurses and social workers, are they caring towards me? And do I have a sense of privacy? And when people look at this model, most people would focus on these things, level of independence, autonomy and control, privacy boundaries. And why would they do that? Why would they, with all these things, it's very common for people to focus on these three things. Because seemingly, they're easy to achieve. Right? They're easy to achieve, at least they're changeable, perhaps for people who are still relatively early in the disease trajectory. And Harvey, a good friend of mine, he continued his research and he found that people who have dignity, who does have a sense of dignity, feel better. They feel they have a greater sense of control and autonomy. They feel like they're not a burden to other people anymore because they're respected and they're valued. They feel like if someone is dignified, they have stronger relationship with their loved ones. A good bag of goodies that comes with dignity. Okay. And this is done, this has been done across, is an international study with Australia, Canada, the US. So there's some, some evidence supporting this. And I looked at this and I said, well, that's great. Uh, it, the, the model has really informed practice and revolutionized how palliative care is being done within the last 10 years. But I looked at the model and I felt like, well, this model, there is, despite its greatness, there is some problem with it. The problem is dignity is a value-laden concept. And with that model being established in a Western Caucasian population in Canada, it may not be fully applicable to people of different cultures. And so with that question, 
me and my team at the University of Hong Kong before I came to Singapore and NTU, we conducted a, another qualitative study. And we looked at what dignity means to Asian Chinese people. We interviewed 18 families, including the patient as well as their primary family caregiver, because we believe that in the Asian context, family perhaps play a bigger role in terms of decision of care, in terms of caregiving, in terms of just being involved in a person's life. For those of us who are Asian in this room, think about the last time you make a major life decision and not talk to your parents about it, or they never bothered you about it. Right? No big decision in the, in the Asian family is made alone. And so we recognize that we probably would like to seek the perspective and the standpoint of the family member who's caring for someone who's dying. And we found something very similar. We found that you know, achieving personal autonomy is very important. You know, elderly person wants to have control. They want to know their prognosis. They want to know what to expect so they can make end of life care decisions. And they can also plan for the future in terms of planning for their own funeral. And this came as a big surprise in the Chinese context. Right? But you know, against conventional thinking, older people in Chinese, Hong Kong, they can talk about this. They want to talk about this. We also found that family connectedness is also important. They need to have a, this sense of connectedness being able to find reconciliation, being able to have the express appreciation towards the family, um, strengthening family bonds, that's important too. And finally, this idea of spiritual plasticity. Whereas in the Western context, we focus on the idea of fighting. We need to fight, to overcome, uh, to cope perhaps. But in the Asian context, at least in the Hong Kong context, older people have often expressed that they don't want to fight anymore. You know, there's no point, why fight? But rather accept it is. You know, surrender yourself to the impermanence of life. And so that's some difference and some similarities. We also found that in order for an elderly, elderly person in the Asian context to have a sense of personal autonomy, the family must have some sort of social agency. Because the elderly person probably won't stand up for himself or they rely on their family member, probably the other children, to stand up for themselves. And these caregivers need to fight and argue and, and, and make their way in, into, the, into the healthcare system and say, well, this is what my parents deserve and you better give it to them. Right? Having that knowledge, having the assertiveness, as well as communicative action. So not just knowledge and not just talking, but actually make things happen. So a patient's sense of dignity is closely related to the family members or family sense of dignity. And we also found that in order for, for elderly patients to have family sense of family connectedness, their family must have this, must, must, be, must be integrated or uh, integrity. Right? And finally, if someone needs spiritual plasticity, plasticity to a, be able to transcend and to let go, um, there's this idea of filial piety in the Chinese context where the the adult children are supposed to take care of their family, uh, their elderly parents, without question, complete obedience. Right? But this doesn't happen anymore in the contemporary context. So complete fully filial piety does not really work anymore. But it's more about filial compassion. The idea that the child can actually step into the shoes of the parents and see their pain and see their suffering and realizing that one day I will die too. And if that's going to happen, I better take care of my parents. Out of love and not out of obligation. So from these two models, we see well, one of the most interesting things about that connects these two models, the Western models and, and the Asian model, is this sense of autonomy, right, the sense of control. So I, look at, I looked into this even a little bit deeper, and I want to ex explore how useful is control. Right? In the United States, there is this great study that's been going on for a long time. It's a health and retirement study, um, and he has collected longitudinal study, longitudinal data from thousands. Uh, tens of thousands of, of elderly Americans. And from this study, we're able to identify people from starting from 2002 up to 2010, all the people that were in the study have who have died. And this included about 5,500 5, people. Out of these 5,000 or so people, 1,700 of them had no advanced directive. So we excluded them. But 2,400 of them had advanced directive. And these people actually made the decision in terms of what they want, the type of care that they want um, at the very end of life. Um, and so they were in control. They, were, they had the sense of autonomy 
and they can make decisions about their care. The remaining 40, 46% or so have no advanced directive. So we were able to compare and contrast what is the outcome like for people who have advanced directive and those who don't have advanced directive. Right? And this is advanced directive in the US where you have given a choice. Right? If you look at the advanced directive in Singapore, there is no choice. The advanced directive form is a two-page two page thing where you only have, what you can only do is actually sign your name on it. There's no choice. There's no way to make a decision for yourself. This is America, and they can make multiple choices. So, and, and so we have these two group of people. We're also able to, to dig out some of the most important data. So when a person dies, their family member came in and does a proxy exit assessment, asking the family member, when your loved one died, the final days, what was his level of pain? Did he have pain? Did he have depression? Did he have uncontrollable anger outbursts or social education? Right? So there was a rating. What do you think we found from this 3,000 people? 60% of advanced directive, 40% of no advanced directive in these types of psychosocial spiritual outcomes. Who would have more pain? Who would have more depression? And we'll have more social agitation. What do you think? Yes? Those without advanced directive, conventional thinking. You know, if you don't, if you're not in control of your life, if you don't make decisions about your care, then probably people don't know what you want. And so you would probably experience more pain, more anxiety, more depression, perhaps better, ang more anger outbursts. But to our surprise, we found that for people who have advanced directive consistently across all 10 years are the ones that experience more pain, more depression, and more social agitation at the end of life, at the final days of life. Right? Even controlling the level of depression at the very beginning. Right? We dig in all these data. That's alarming. And not only that, if you look at the, the, the process from 2002 to 2010, this is consistent. Nothing has really changed. People with advanced directive, they're doing much poorer at the final days of life. More pain, more depression. And I guess the thing that really helped me to, to relieve my anxiety a little bit better, though, is when I try to separate them into different, different disease groups. So if I look at patients who have cancer, they're actually doing pretty well. Right? There, there's no significant finding. Right, so perhaps this also reflects that current palliative care is mostly directed against or direct targeting of people with cancer. While those with lung disease, heart disease, strokes, or memory-related problems such as dementia, they're not doing as well. They are still experiencing higher level of pain as well as higher level of depression, even with advanced directive. And what does that tell us? Perhaps we should not just focus on these things, but focus on something else. You know, there's, there's, there's things that medicine can do, and they do it very well. But when a person is dying, it's not only the physical aspect that they're concerned about. It's the whole totality of this person. Jane Cecilia Saunders, who's the founder of the hospice care movement in 1960, she developed this idea of total pain, total person cared. When we have to care for someone who's dying, we not only have to look at the physical aspect, but the person is entirety. Right? And perhaps spirituality is also a very important component of it. In Chosnoff's model, or Harvey's model, he talks about this idea of leaving something behind, generativity and, and, and legacy. This is related to Eric Erickson model of despair and integrity at the end of life, the final stages of life. If someone feels there are, there's great integrity, which means they can leave something behind. They made a meaning of their life. Right? So leaving something behind, creating something, was important in the Western context. Acceptance. Right? How do we find acceptance? Well, this is highly, highly emphasized as well. And perhaps living in this moment, waking up every morning and not asking yourself, when are you going to die, but asking yourself, I still have a lot of time. What should I do today? Perhaps that change of a perspective can really help people live in the moment, enjoy it, and not be, be afraid of it. One thing that's also, it's perhaps it's easier to change, 
is this idea of care tender. Care tender is really the concept of how you're being cared of, the attitude of the healthcare provider uh, that you see every day when they're sick. When I was in Hong Kong, I talked to some of the patients, and one, one story that struck me, and it just remains in my, in my heart and, and mind all the time. I was interviewing this 30-year-old son. His name is Andrew, uh, similar to my name. He's younger than me, but his father is 59, and he's dying from lung cancer. They're not a very well-off family. His mother, his father was a construction worker, and he only had high school education. Family of four, mother, uh, father, uh, Andrew and his wife is living in the same flat, public housing. Okay? And I asked him, well, can you tell me experience when you feel like you really don't feel you're dignified? And he said, well, there was one time when I had to visit a doctor, because in Hong Kong, uh, you, despite the fact that you're getting palliative care, you're still not receiving the same consistent care team, because there are different departments that you you have to maneuver and travel to. There's one time I went into a doctor's office. My, my father had great pain in his stomach. And they both sat down in front of the doctor's office, and the doctor was looking at this x-ray, and Andrew goes, you know, doctor, my, my dad is having great pain. I don't know what I can do. He couldn't sleep. I really want to do something to help him. And this doctor looked at his x-ray and said, the x-ray looks fine. There's nothing wrong with him. You can go now. And Andrew said, no, no, really, seriously, this, my father is experiencing great pain. What can I do? You know, what can I do, doctor? And the doctor looked at his x-rays again and just said, there is nothing I can do. The x-ray is fine. If you need help, go back to the pair of care unit. And not only that, within that two minute of conversation and dialogue, Andrew said the most disrespecting thing that he felt was this doctor never once looked him in the eye. As, he, as if he never existed. Care tender. That can be changed. When we look at the Chinese model, spiritual plasticity as well as filial compassion, that can also be changed as well. Because it's also changing a matter of perspective. How are we able to allow people, or, or cultivate, or, or promote people widening their perspective? to see, to really step into the shoes of another and see their pain so that the care that they provide is not out of obligation, but out of real love. We looked even deeper. So we looked at the family. We looked at uh, the patient themselves. We also looked at the healthcare system. We looked at, we worked with a series of nursing home staff, hospital, hospital clinicians, as well as policymakers who established an end-of-life care pathway in Hong Kong. And we did an analysis and asked them, well, what made this work? They gave us the usual thing, right? They have regulatory empowerment. You need to have resources. You need to have communication. You have to collaborate with policymaking. That's basic. You, they also told us that you need to have family-centered care. You can't just deal with the patient. You have to work with the entire family as a team. Also, that there needs to be continuity of care that the patient and the family cannot be a soccer ball kicked around in the stadium. Right? They need to have a consistent care team to look after them. And what's most important when they talk about this is in order for them to achieve family-centered care and regulatory empowerment when they work, work at policy together to come up with a resolution, they need the sense of collective compassion. They need to understand that what they're doing is actually doing some good to another human being. And they also understand that I'm improving a system in which I will also be in sooner or later. And this sense of not just me, but also another person. And what does all these models really tell us about living a good death? I think uh, not only in the Asian context, I think worldwide, perhaps we have give this family emphasis or collective ideology much greater weight because family is, is a universal language. Okay? Every one of us, no matter what color of the skin or culture, family is important. And perhaps we should change the paradigm of just patient-centered care, which is still trying to get there, but expand it further to include a patient-family-centered care. Working as the, with the family as, the, with, as well as the patient as one unit of care. And also, when you work with the family, they're, you just don't have to perceive them as care recipients because family has great strength. 
how can healthcare professionals identify those strengths and enhance it so they can become your partner in care? Okay, that's important. Secondly, I think advanced directive, despite my findings, I think it's still important because it does provide people with the opportunity to say what they wanted. But I think what's been going on in the state is that advanced directive has been done perhaps in the wrong way. Advanced directive often is seen as only a legal document. Once you've signed it, you have witness, lawyers there, and it's, it's done. Right? And it's mostly done by a physician. When you look at the medical curriculum of any doctors in the world, you would see that they are trained to cure, provide care in any type of illnesses. But there's no single course that talks about death and dying, that talks about end of life, or provide them with the opportunity for them to explore what death and dying means to them. How can a doctor in practice deal with life and death situation every day, never had the opportunity to explore their own fear or their sense of mortality? How do you expect these doctors to go out and talk to patients about end-of-life care when end-of-life care is just the beginning of a whole conversation and dialogue? Advanced care planning is, an, is a better step where there's a process of dialogue continuation. Once you made the decision, you come back and revisit it regularly because people need and desire change. I may have an advanced directive 20 years ago. I actually made one five years ago. And I probably should go back and look at my advanced directive and see if this is something that I want now. Because people's circumstances and beliefs and, and ideas change. And so it must be not just a legal document, but a continuous dialogue of trust and relationship building between the healthcare team as well as the patient and the family. It also signifies there's a great need to enhance the psychosocial spiritual care in end of life care. Right? So far for the Ever since the hospice movement, ever since the 1960s, we have come a long way. We are very good in hardware. Right? Most countries, Singapore ranked two, two years ago, there was a paper published by the Economics Intelligence Unit who ranked Singapore 12th or 14th amongst most developed regions. They have the top palliative care units of healthcare system in the world. But those outcome indicators, they're mostly calculable. They're quantifiable. But some things about end-of-life care cannot be calculated or quantified. Right? We have the hardware. We have the technology. We don't have the software. We don't have the human capital or the humanity for us to understand what a dying person is going through and provide the support that they desperately need. And not only do you have to provide these support for people who are dying as well as brief families, but also people who are actually providing the care. Quality of care of any healthcare system is only as good as the quality of health of the people who are providing it. If a doctor, a nurse, or a social worker, they're burnt out, they become cynical of their job, they go to the work and they're like, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't think I want to be served or helped or supported by people like this. And if you look at the current system of healthcare, when did healthcare professionals actually have the space or the chance to really look at what death and dying means to them? Or even to have the opportunity to express their grief because losing a patient is a great loss. We needed that. And perhaps one way to, to enhance that is to really develop an effective and emotional-based medical humanities curriculum in medical school right now, right this present moment. I think throughout all these different models, there's also something that's very important, is the importance of language and discourse. Language and discourse in the context of what Michael Foucault has talked about, the power of language, the power that are built within language. How can we penetrate all these different layers of bureaucracy as well as institution so that everybody comes to the same page to work for the better good of people who are dying? Well, first of all, they have to realize that they will one day die too. That, that's, a great, that's a great thing to start with. 
But the idea is how can we incorporate the compassion into the public discourse, into a medical discourse? Because compassion, when people are working on the same page, they are trusting and they're available, they can be able to develop a resolution that addresses everybody's needs. Perhaps a process of negotiation. And the good thing is, uh, although compassion seems very out there, it is actually, uh, you can actually nurture it. You can cultivate it and you can build it. So what is compassion? There's multiple, multiple explanation out there. <laughs> but, um, but the most fundamental basis of compassion is the awareness that I have an awareness of suffering. I have the capacity to be aware, to be present, and to understand that someone else or myself is suffering and there's pain. And not only with awareness, I, I have awareness without judgment, so that I'm not judging. And that is actually very hard. Because think back to the last time you met someone new, a totally new person. The first five seconds that you look at a person's face from top to bottom, what are you doing? You're scanning him or her. And through that scan, you're already judging. Uh, he has this hairstyle, he's not wearing a suit, he's wearing jeans or whatever it is. I know, sort of know where to put him in my framework. Right? Compassion is about aware but not judging. Right? And also about the idea that you are aware of suffering and you have this innate desire to reduce that suffering. This is the fundamental of it. Never impose on others what you do not choose for yourself. The golden rule of human conduct. A single concept that is interwoven into every religion in this world. Never impose on others what you do not choose for yourself. Right? To dethrone yourself from the center of your universe and put another person there. See the world from their perspective and try to understand where they're coming from. And try to understand what their needs are. <laughs> and when we talk about suffering, because compassion has to do with the ability to recognize suffering, what is suffering? Well, suffering can come from many, many different places. You know, there's physical suffering, there's also psychological, emotional, uh, existential pain. Uh, that, that's basically inescapable. Our lives is full of pain. Growing up is painful. Right? Being born is actually painful, at least for your mother. <laughs> And it's also about this idea of being stuck, rigid thinking. Um, there's this Buddhist story where the, Buddhist, where the disciple of a Buddhist went up to a Buddhist, Buddha and said, well, I don't know how to reduce all these suffering in the world. What can we do? And the Buddhists say, we know suffering and pain is like an arrow. Now, everybody gets shot by an arrow all the time, unexpectedly, randomly. We get shot all the time. But what distinguishes people who can live relatively contently with suffering and those who are dueling in pain is the is those who are dueling in pain they stab themselves in a sort of second arrow the meaning behind that is that pain is inescapable we deal with pain all the time and it comes unexpectedly but for some of us when we receive pain when we get terminal illness when we get cancer or whatever we would say why does this happen to me why does every other people who are horrible and don't have to die? And why do I have to die? Right? The second arrow is our perception of what is happening to us. And oftentimes, these perceptions are not good things. Right? Research has shown that when we're idle, when we're sitting here and not doing anything, or just walking, not thinking, we go into this automatic pilot mode. And what do we do in autopilot? Do you know? We think negatively about ourselves. We think how insufficient we are and how we can do better. And perhaps from an anthropological point of view, this is a, a survival of the fittest. We always have to think about what we need to do to enhance ourselves, to save ourselves, protect ourselves. Right? But that, that sense, the idea of pain, uh, which cannot be dodged, but suffering, our perception of the pain, can actually be changed. And in order for us to really cultivate that awareness, to cultivate awareness 
without judgment, there is things that we can do. Compassion really comprises of three things. The first thing is what we call now mindfulness. Mindfulness is being aware of the present moment without judgment, being aware, right? being really here. The second component of compassion is kindness, that we are fellow human beings. We share a common humanity. And why can't we be kind to each other? Right? And thirdly, uh, this common humanity is that, that although we might be in experience that we think we're in alone, but we shared it. Every one, especially in our life, every one of us dies. And we realize that the experience that we feel is unique, is so unique that we, no one, no, nobody understands me. Um, through compassion, we can probably uh, help people understand themselves or have a listening ear that they feel heard. And when we talk about compassion, oftentimes we're talking about compassion towards another person. We must have compassion towards you, uh, my patients, uh, my clients, or my colleagues who are suffering or having a bad time at work. But we very often, very less often, talk about this idea of self-compassion. How can we provide compassion to ourselves? Because as we all know, we have this, this term in psychology called compassion fatigue. If we have too much compassion for that person, we become stressed. We become burned out and cynical about our work. And so there is a way. Compassion can be turned within, where we can be aware of what we are feeling, be aware of our emotion, what signal is our body giving us, and be aware of it without judgment. Without judging, I'm feeling sad because I'm a horrible person. Okay? Just that I'm feeling sad, not horrible. Okay? And, and with a greater sense of self-compassion, love, and kindness towards yourself, it fosters interconnectedness with yourself as well as with another person. Okay? It allows us to cultivate this open mind and open heart when we see novelty, or when we see repetitive things that are happening. And if there's a golden rule, never impose on what others what we do not choose for yourself, I think there's also a self-imperative. Never impose on self what you would not wish for others. And we need to take care of ourselves, especially clinicians, doctors, and social workers who are in end-of-life care, who are taking care of people who are dying every day, but nobody takes care of them. We need to cultivate this capacity to be aware, mindful, and kind to ourselves. And so what is mindfulness? I talked a little bit about this, mindfulness. So basically is being in the present moment, fully present here and now, without judgment, without judging. I think this is a great idea of what it is, a great illustration of what it is. We can have a mind full of rubbish, right? And that's what most of us have anyways, because we sit here, our mind just goes everywhere. But right? we're never really here because if you sometimes you have time to actually study your own mind and just step out and look at what your mind is thinking, all of us would probably be sitting here. You might be sitting here listening to me, but in your mind you'd be like, oh, "This guy's so boring," or you'd be thinking, "Well, you know, I, I have so many things to do. I need to get to my work, and I'm still here, stuck here." Or you'd be thinking, "Well, I could have done better in my paper. I need to write my paper better, or you know, whatever it is." We're often stuck in the past regrets or we're not here because we're worried about the future, because our mind is cluttered with all these rubbish that we are never here in the present moment with clarity and openness and awareness. Because this is true. I mean, for a physician, uh, well, for, for a cancer patient, you know, he might be talking to his family, he might be having dinner, and he's probably thinking, I have to attend another chemo session tomorrow. And all the stress and anxiety that comes along with it fills up his mind. He is physically here, but emotionally, spiritually, he's gone. Right? For a doctor, he might be treating a patient in that two-minute dialogue. In his mind, he's probably going, oh, I have 10 more patients to see, three reports to do, and two meetings in the afternoon. Think about the last time you're in a meeting and you're talking to someone, or someone is talking to someone else and you're just in the meeting. Were you really there? Were you really present? You 
know, some of us may be even thinking, well, I'm my son's of exams tomorrow, I'm the daughter of a piano class, I have to go back and, and deal with that. And some of us who travel a long way to Singapore, you might be sitting in this chair and you might be thinking, another 13 hour flight tomorrow, oh my god, I can't deal with the jag lag anymore. Right? Some of you may be thinking about that while you're physically here, but not really here. And often time in the clinical setting or in the life setting, patient loses their mind. Right? They loses their mind within the midst of treatment and therapy. There's so many things that they could do or propose to them, they don't know what to do. Right? And for clinicians, they can be losing our humanities in the tools of in, in the therapeutic tools, focusing so much on technologies and treatment where we lose the most basic need for human, which is relationship and personal touch. And not be fully present is a great travesty of life. Think about the last meal that you had. What were you doing while you're eating? That's great. That's great. Apart from eating, what else were you doing? Talking. If we're eating alone often, what do we do? If we're in a restaurant or we're eating alone or having a sandwich in the office, what are we doing? That's great. <laughs> That's great. That's, you're very mindful. That's awesome. But for a lot of us, we might be shoving food into our mouth, but we are poking our iPhone or Note 2, whatever it is, flipping through news. Or we might have a fork inside a lunchbox and typing away. Right? Or we might be watching television. A lot of us don't even remember what food tastes like. Or we don't even taste it. We just keep on shoving stuff down our throat, making sure that we're filled up. That's a great travesty. You live a life, eat food, and not knowing what it tastes like. What, how is that different from being a zombie? You eat brains, and that's all you do. Right? Right? If we're not here, if we're not aware, how is it different when we're in a conversation, we hear, but it goes straight out the other ear. Right? It's like talking to our parents when we we're young. Right? Our parents lecturing us and we're just, yes, 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 but nothing goes through. Right? We hear, but we don't listen. Imagine you talk to a doctor, and the doctor, yes, 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 but nothing, nothing goes in. Nothing sticks. Or a social worker who's supposed to provide support, nothing sticks. Right? Imagine if you're, exactly, if you're eating and you're not tasting food, you're touching something, a person, a hand, but you're not feeling the other person. Now, this is the worst thing that could he happen in a human life. Right? This, is, this is what happens when we're not fully present, when we're not here. One way, there's, there's a good way to really enhance or practice this, this sense of awareness, to be fully present, is mindfulness practice. And I think a lot of us have heard probably enough about this in, in, in social media. Oprah have talked about this all the time. Right? The most influential, or used to be the most influential woman in America, or the world. And mindfulness practice is really about the moment to the moment, purposive attentiveness. Okay? I'm here not only in my present, I'm also attentive. And there's a purpose for me to be here. To be here and realize what I'm actually doing. When I'm eating food, I'm actually eating food, tasting the food, and not shoving it down our throat. When I'm talking to my partner, or go home and talk to my wife or my husband, I'm actually listening to him, and not just being a voice recorder, and say, yes, yes ma'am. No, that's not what we do. Right? And with the, that goal of being present, we can really cultivate clarity. We can expand perspective, because for example, a lot of us have pressure points or stress points, right? Things that we, people cannot touch. If someone came by and yelled something at me and probably yelled something about my age or something, then I'll probably get really mad, really mad and I would respond right away. Right? There's no pause. It's an automatic reaction. Right? If I get into an argument with someone and someone hit my pressure point and I respond right away, the outcome is probably not very good, is it? because it will lead to another argument, it will probably escalate, lead to retribution, 
right? no reconciliation. But if we can have that awareness, when someone says some pretty nasty things to me, and I listen to it, and I become aware of it, and I sort of have that moment of clarity, my options become limitless. I do not have to respond right away. And without responding right away, I have choices. And that allows us to cultivate compassion as well. So what is mindfulness? First of all, you need to have to, to really pay attention to the present moment. And secondly, relate experience, relating yourself to experience without judgment or resistance. Not to run away from it or to judge it. Allowing it to happen and just be present when it happens. Relating to the experience as someone who is experiencing suffering and have this desire to alleviate it, to lift it, right? to reduce the suffering. And that's where compassion comes in. And finally, understand that the experience and the experiencer and yourself are separate entities. This is important, especially for those who are in end-of-life end of care. Because when they lose someone, when they lose a patient, they often felt that this is their fault. When they work with someone who is terminally ill and experiencing a lot of pain, they often felt, I could have done more. But this wisdom allows us to understand that their pain and their suffering, I'm not the cause of it. But I am there, hopefully, be able to help you reduce those pains. And these things actually accumulate and work uh, built up on each other. And so practice of mindfulness, it, it's not it doesn't require a gym membership. Right? It doesn't require any asparagus right? or a treadmill. You can just sit down in this chair and you can do mindfulness right now. You can do mindfulness while you're walking. Yeah. Really, really look at and, and, and be aware and present when you're walking. Do mindful eating. Really chew your food and taste what your food tastes like. No, if you really chew plain rice, long enough, it's actually very sweet. I don't know if you know that. Okay. Try doing that next time. Right? And so when you're doing whatever you're doing, you're just paying full attention to it and having awareness of what is going on, which provides clarity and perspective. And many research have shown if you engage in a regular practice of mindfulness, there is great opportunity for you to reduce stress. Because you reduce all those negativity that automatically goes on in our brain when we're, in, when we're idle. And the core elements of mindfulness practice include intention. So why are you sitting here meditating or trying to do mindfulness? Because you, there's intention. The intention is to do mindfulness. Not the intention to reduce stress, but the intention that I just want to have a piece of clarity and a moment to be by myself. The important thing is to remember the most important thing. When I'm sweeping the floor, I should be sweeping the floor and doing nothing else. When I'm writing, when I'm eating a burger, I should be eating a burger. When I'm writing my, my paper, I shouldn't be thinking about another paper. I focus on this paper. Okay? Secondly, is really attention. Moment to moment awareness. Stop your mind from jumping to the past or going back in, into the future. But we can, really can. It's, it's a practice because our mind just, it's a, like a monkey mind. We jump from places and thoughts all the time. And Christopher Germer, who is the person who, who really established this idea of self-compassion, he says, an unstable mind is like an unstable camera. We get fuzzy pictures. We don't really see what is going on, at least not a clear sense of it. And finally, attitude. If we practice mindfulness and be present and be aware without judgment, these are the things that we can really cultivate. Acceptance, kindness, compassion towards yourself as well as other people. And the good thing is, what we practice actually makes us stronger. You know? uh, every habit, you know, research has shown, every habit that you want to develop, or every exercise you want to develop, you do it for seven days. And eventually, you won't want to do it continuously. And with mindfulness, the more you practice, the, the greater the space that you're allowed to give yourself when you're dealing with tr stress, when you're dealing with travesty. Allows us to slow down. Do we always want to be here in this highway? Or perhaps we want to stay here sometimes, right? And
And mindfulness, although it's been, it's really an ancient Taoism practice and Buddhist practice, which has been brought to the United States by a person named John Capucine, and did a whole series of research on it, which is great, actually, because he removed the religious connotation to mindfulness and made it secular and provided clinical evidence that this is actually useful. And with that evidence, the University of Hong Kong Medical School have actually started a medical humanities program uh, two years ago, which I play a big role in it. And one of the things that I was involved in was cultivating mindfulness practice for first year, second year medical students, including also expressive art, as well as other type of uh, multimedia creative mediums so that they can actually realize or experience healing as well as suffering. In the University of Rochester, they talk about mindful communication. How can we enhance communication between clinician, patients, and family when, well, the one way to enhance this is when the doctor is actually there, when the doctor is actually listening, and not just hearing, but listening to what you have to say. And when I came to Singapore, I was very fortunate to have, the, to have the freedom to develop my own course. And now I'm teaching a course on deaf, dying, and bereavement with undergraduate and graduate students. And the first thing in my class that a student has to do when they come here is practice mindfulness for five minutes. And we do it together as a class. We create something called a mindful classroom. When a student is actually here, present, have clarity, and ready to learn. And at the end of the class, we do this again. So they can have that sense of clarity, perhaps curiosity, a new perspective to carry out with them for the entire day. And we're not just doing this in Hong Kong and Singapore. You have all these universities. Harvard Medical School is doing this. Meditation and mindfulness in clinical practices. Contemplative medicine, mind and medicine in University of Man uh, Mass Massachusetts. Um, Brown University, Contemplative Studies in Medicine, McGill University in Canada talk about mindfulness-based medical practices. So it's happening around the world. And I think uh, we should really try to promote this in different universities, especially LKC Medicine, if we could. And I guess to give you a little bit of summary, mindfulness is about the presence of your heart, you know, to be here. This Chinese character, what is it, do you know? Nian. Lean, right? It's about thinking, thinking or, or, or cherishing thinking. And it's made out of two words, actually. What's the top word? Now, jing, right? Now. And what's the second word? Jing, heart. So it's really about your heart, not just your physical body. Your heart and your mind are really here at the present moment. It's also not just a practice of the heart, but it also enhances your plasticity of the mind. Because a whole series, well, not a whole, but there's increasing research out there that are telling us that if we practice mindfulness long enough, maybe not too long, just an eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction program, Sarah Lazarus from Harvard Medical School was able to identify that a certain area of the brain, which is dealing with emotion, emotion regulation, intelligence, perspective taking, the gray matter in that particular region, upper, upper hippocampus, actually enlarges after eight weeks. And I think we need more research like that, perhaps in LKC medicine, as well as MPU. And in terms of patients, cancer patients, research have been have shown that cancer patients who actually practice mindfulness receive much greater sense of quality of life, less physical symptoms, less agitation, less anxiety, less depressive symptoms. I mean, there's multiple evidence out there. How can we, how can we perhaps use those experiences and bring it to Singapore or bring it back to your country, wherever you're from? And I think the best way to really, to really experience it is not just by listening to me, but actually practice this. And I would like to invite all of you to engage in this activity with me. Okay? So what would I like you to do, if you would like to, that is, there is no forcing here. Right? It's a free country. At least, yes, it's a free country. I would like you to just really find a spot in your chair that you feel comfortable. 
perhaps have both of your feet planted on the ground so you do feel supported and rooted. And do let go of all these earthly attachments that you have. Maybe you have a cell phone in your hand or you have carrying a bag or whatever it is. Just let it go. It will still be there when we open our eyes again. Okay. And just sit here uh, with our feet planted on the ground. Perhaps we can let go of our hand and just put it gently on top of our lap in a relaxed position. If you like to, and if you're ready, I would like you to gently invite you to close your eyes. And just be aware of where you are. In this practice, we would like to really train our mind to have the sense of clarity and be aware of what we're doing. Allow yourself to switch from the usual mode of doing to this mode of non-doing, non-striving, and just simply being. Allow yourself and your body to become still. And bring your attention and awareness to the fact that you are breathing. Although we don't recognize it, but the most basic necessity of life, with every single breath, it nourishes us. Become aware of the movement of your breath and how the breath comes in into your nostril, through your chest, and perhaps all the way down to your abdomen. Be aware of how your tummy expands as you inhale, and how it deflates as you exhale. Not manipulating your breath in any way, simply be aware of it and the feelings associated with breathing. Being totally here in each moment with every in-breath and every out-breath. Not trying to do anything. There's nowhere else you need to go. You're already here in the present, in the here and now. You might find that from time to time, your mind will wander off to thoughts, fantasies, anticipation of the future, and perhaps regrets about the past, worrying, memories, whatever it may be. And when you notice that your attention is no longer with your breath, without judgment, simply invite your attention back into your breath. Every time you find your mind wandering off with the breath, gently bring it back to the present, back to the moment of moment observing life, observing the flow of your breath, using your breath to help you tune into a state of relaxation and stillness. Breathing in and breathing out, like riding the waves of the seashore in an endless cycle of flow. Breathing in loving kindness and allowing this feeling to penetrate every part of your body. Allow kindness and care to fill every muscle, every cell, and every molecule in your body. allowing yourself to breathe, to be in stillness. With every out-breath, knowing that you have the capacity 
to give out love, kindness, and compassion. Breathing in and breathing out. There's nowhere you need to be, nowhere you need to go. You're already here, you're already home. Breathing in, I know that I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know that I'm breathing out. The moment was how to define a moment. I I can I can understand. So no every jump is different. The moment and no more time. No more time is here. What is the moment? It's that thing that's just beyond the senses. Oh my I don't know. I think with the few minutes of clarity that we have, and we allow ourselves to really open up, to open up our heart and open up our mind, even the simplest of things we find beauty in, we can identify with, and we can have an emotional engagement with it. Think about this. The next time you're working with a patient, 
Perhaps working with students, or working with your spouse, your husband, your wife. Have the level of patience. Have that level of awareness. And perhaps you can truly feel what he or she is feeling. And I think, and I hope, with a better or more fulfilled medical humanities program, including components of mindfulness or other creative, cre creative mediums, our doctors will have the awareness and the ability to understand and comprehend and respond to the needs and desires and the wishes and the concerns of people who are dying which is every one of us, because we all die. And when we do, I hope we won't see doctors like you. When the blind goes beep or the beep stop, stop beeping, you can call me. I hope we don't see doctors like this. And I also hope that perhaps, like Robert Pope, we can find peace and solace in our own lives in our own end of life. As the Dalai Lama says, love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. And working in the past decade, trying to understand what dying people are going through, I think this really defines my understanding. Suffering breaks open our hearts, and through that breakage comes compassion. The true understanding of another suffering the quiet joy of being with another in their pain, and the liberation of dignity and our common humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much.